Have you ever wondered how fear is born? Not nervousness, not discomfort, but real deep uncontrollable fear? Not all fear is instinct. Some is taught and sometimes it's created on purpose. What we call cruel today was once called science, an experiment conducted on a baby. This is the story of little Albert, an infant used to prove a theory and a psychological experiment that still echoes through history. It's about fear, about control, and the question, how far is science willing to go? The year is 1920. In a dim hallway of Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, a man prepares to make history and quietly destroy a small piece of innocence. His name, John B. Watson, the father of behaviorism, a movement that believed all behavior is learned. No soul, no inner life, only stimulus and response. Beside him, Rosalie Rayner, his assistant, later his lover, and co-author of one of the most controversial studies in psychology. Their goal? To prove that even fear, one of the most primal human emotions, was not inborn, but learned, conditioned like a trick. For that, they needed a subject, pure, untouched, a blank slate. They found him in the university hospital's pediatric unit, a healthy, calm, curious baby around nine months old. He was given a code name, Albert B., later known simply as Little Albert. Albert was an ordinary child, unaware, innocent. His gaze was open, unfiltered, his world safe. But what came next would forever reshape his reality. First, Watson and Rayner tested Albert's reactions. They wanted to know what he wasn't afraid of. They showed him animals, a white rat, a rabbit, a dog, then burning newspapers, masks, a Santa Claus beard. Albert remained calm, curious, no signs of fear. That was proof. He had not yet learned to associate these things with danger. That made him the perfect subject. Then the conditioning began, and with it, the unraveling. They placed the white rat before Albert. He smiled, reached for it. In that moment, Watson struck a steel bar with a hammer, a deafening sound. Albert flinched, startled. He began to cry. They repeated the process, over and over. Rat, smile, loud noise, tears. Rat, noise. Rat, fear. After just a few trials, it worked. Albert began to cry. At the mere sight of the rat, Watson celebrated. His theory was working. Fear was not instinct. It was programmable, a product of repetition. But while Watson smiled, Albert trembled. And then Watson asked a deeper question. Can fear spread? What began in a quiet lab started to spread like an invisible virus through Albert's world. The rat was no longer an animal. It was a symbol, a trigger, a container for fear. And the metal strike no longer needed. Watson had achieved his goal. Fear without sound. Fear through sight alone. But he wasn't done. He wanted more. To prove that emotions can generalize, that fear could jump from one object to another through association. So they introduced new stimuli, a rabbit, a dog, a fur coat, a Santa Claus mask, a cotton ball. Albert cried. He trembled. He screamed. He was now afraid of anything, white, furry, soft, or animal-like. The fear had spread, like fire catching dry wood from a rat to the world. What began as a controlled experiment had become something else. Uncontained, unethical, undeniably effective. Albert had been changed, not by trauma in life, but by a theory. And Watson, he documented everything, took notes, published findings, proud of what he'd proven. Emotion was no longer sacred. It was a system, a switchboard, stimulus in, response out, Albert wasn't a child anymore. He was a case study. But others began to whisper, not loudly, not publicly, but behind closed doors. What about ethics? What about responsibility? What happens when the experiment ends? Because one thing was clear, Albert had been taught fear, but no one taught him how to undo it. Watson had no plan to decondition the child, no intention to help him unlearn the fear, no reversal. 
No healing. Albert had served his purpose. And then he was forgotten. The experiment was never repeated. Not officially. Shortly after, Watson was fired from Johns Hopkins. Not because of the experiment, but due to an affair with Rosalie Rayner. His academic career was over, but his influence was just beginning. He moved into advertising. And that wasn't a coincidence. Because a man who knows how to create fear also knows how to create desire, not with steel bars, but with images, with associations, with repetition. Watson's methods became the foundation of modern marketing, political messaging, education. We like to think we left little Albert behind, but he's everywhere. And still, one question remained, unanswered for decades. Who was little Albert? For decades, little Albert was a ghost. A symbol in textbooks, a lesson in conditioning, but without a face, without a voice, without a fate, psychology students studied him, but no one knew who he really was, until the early 2000s, when two researchers decided to follow the trail, Hall P., Beck and Sean Green, they set out to uncover the truth, was little Albert just a theory, or a person with a story no one had told, they searched archives, hospital records, university files sealed by time, and they found clues. Albert wasn't an orphan as many believed. He was a child of a hospital nurse, a single mother who likely agreed to the experiment for money, desperate, trusting, unaware of what would follow. His real name, Douglas Marie. Douglas, not a code, not a theory, a real child, one with a life, a family, and as it turned out, an illness, the researchers discovered medical records showing that Douglas had been born with hydrocephalus, a condition where fluid builds up in the brain, causing pressure, damage, and in some cases, neurological impairment. He died young, at just six years old. The same boy Watson condition may have been dying the entire time, and that raised a chilling question. Did Watson know did he choose Douglas? Because he believed the boy wouldn't live long anyway? We may never know, but the idea lingers, like the echo of a metal strike in a child's memory. So what does this all mean? Why do we still tell the story of little Albert? Because it forces us to confront something uncomfortable, that not all knowledge is ethical. That just because we can learn something doesn't mean we should, and that behind every data point might be someone who never had a choice. Little Albert was real, and he was afraid, because someone wanted him to be. But the mystery doesn't end there, because another theory emerged, and it changed everything again. Was Douglas Mary really Little Albert? Not everyone was convinced. Shortly after the theory was published, another researcher stepped forward, Russell A. Powell with his own team, following a different trail. Their investigation led to a second boy, a child who had also been in the Johns Hopkins nursery, at the same time as the experiment. His name? William Barger. Like Douglas, William had been referred to as Albert, because Albert was his middle name. And at home, that's what everyone called him. But unlike Douglas, William was healthy. He lived a full life, and he died in 2007, at the age of 87. If William was the real little Albert, then everything changed. There was no neurological illness, no early death, just a man who may have never known. He was once a subject in a historic and ethically questionable experiment. So who was it? Was it Douglas, the sick child who died young? Or William, the healthy one who lived a normal life? The records are incomplete. The evidence is conflicting. The names were never officially released, and those involved are long gone. We may never know the full truth, but maybe, just maybe, that's the point. Because whether it was Douglas or William, the story of little Albert forces us to confront something far more important than identity. It forces us to look at the very core of how science treats people, not as souls, not as minds, but as data, as variables. As opportunities, the experiment ended, the papers were published, the theory took root, and yet, decades later, 
Albert's fear still lives. In classrooms, where students memorize a story. In textbooks, where his reaction is charted like a formula. And in labs, boardrooms, and systems that still treat people like projects. Watson believed that behavior was programmable. That fear could be installed like software. He wasn't wrong. But what he never asked was, what happens when the experiment ends? But the fear stays? Little Albert is gone. Whether he was Douglas or William, whether he died young or lived a quiet life, the world never truly saw his face. But we remember his fear, his trembling, his tears, and we learn from them, perhaps too much, because Watson's legacy didn't die in a lab. It seeped into society, into advertising, that manipulates emotion through association, into education, that trains behavior more than it cultivates thought, into politics, that sells ideas by repeating images until they become instinct. The world didn't forget little Albert. It became him. He was the beginning. A quiet proof that the human mind can be rewritten, not with kindness, but with control. If fear can be installed, it can also be hidden, buried beneath slogans, tied to colors, woven into culture. And if a child can be made afraid of a rat, what have we been conditioned to fear? What lives in us now that we never chose? That is the true weight of Albert's story, not the experiment itself what it reveals about us, how easily we turn people into objects, how quickly we silence their discomfort. If it serves a goal, how far we'll go to prove a point, even if it scars someone permanently. Albert was a child, curious, open, trusting, and he was changed, not by trauma from life, but by an idea, by curiosity, untethered from compassion. Every experiment leaves a mark even if we can't see it, and some truths are not worth learning. If they cost someone their peace, maybe what Albert teaches us now isn't scientific. Maybe it's human. That knowledge without empathy is just another form of violence. That conditioning without care is cruelty in disguise, and that behind every brilliant theory may be a voice that was never heard. He was a baby, a boy, and then, an idea. That was little Albert. And if we're willing, his fear can become something else. Awareness, responsibility, compassion. Because insight only becomes wisdom when it doesn't come at someone else's expense.